Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 20th, 2018, and this is the week in charts. I can get everything to work. Here we go. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate you doing that, so thank you. I'm humbled by your presence. There is the disclaimer screen. As you know, you could lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. A line borrowed from Greg Morris. So what do we talk about? First of all, as usual, we will talk about the current market conditions. And I notice I have new bull leg in. I'm not sure when I put that in there. But we'll focus on that when we get to the charts. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep the questions relative to what's on the slides. And that's just because my ADD will kick in and I'll go off on a rant. Might be a good rant, might be a bad rant. And, of course, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, wait until we get to the actual charts for that. You can ask about as many stocks if you want, as you want. But for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time and then hit return. So this week, our focus is going to be five simple steps towards your trading success. So let's talk about five simple steps to your trading success. Now, before we do that, there are a few assumptions. First of all, you have studied a methodology thoroughly and know the good, the bad, and the ugly. One of the reoccurring themes in today's presentation as I'm putting everything together is that we all have a shared psychology and no matter how long you've been at this we all are prone to make these psychological errors so make sure you know the good the bad and the ugly when it comes to studying a methodology i'll give you a for instance i have recently discovered some really cool ipo things and then not so recently some ipo stuff that's really neat too and as I go through the IPO charts every night in my analysis, in fact, even more recently, last few days, I find myself getting more and more and more excited about these IPOs. And I've actually had to force myself to look for examples where it simply flat out did not work. And that's just, that's human nature. Now, I know I preach, always look for the good in everything, but when you're developing a methodology, you have to play devil's advocate. You also have to thoroughly, you have to have studied it thoroughly. As I often say, find 100 examples. Find some that worked, find some that didn't, find some in good conditions, find some in bad conditions, find some in mediocre conditions. As I say quite often, called up a friend once, he was in a trade, just got in a trade. I'm like, oh, well, what are you doing there? Well, I'm using this guy's counting method. Oh, okay. How long have you been doing that? Well, I just read about it this morning. So he obviously didn't do the due diligence, and he's just diving right in. So whether it's my stuff or somebody else's stuff, do your own due diligence. And as I preach ad nauseum, make sure you are playing devil's advocate. So look for the good, but also look for the bad. Now, here's a biggie. I'm assuming that you are adequately capitalized and not trading with the rent and grocery money. Now, ironically, as I'm putting this together, there are some things, and I'll get into just a few minutes, where you don't necessarily have to be broke to not be adequately capitalized, but you might look at your trading account in a certain way for other than trading. For instance, I know very wealthy people who look at their trading account, see how much money they made on a series of trades or whatever, and they immediately mentally monetize that into a car, a boat, a house, or whatever. And I'm guilty of that too, as I'll explain in just a minute. 
But if you don't have enough money to trade and you need that money, you're going to be forced to take that money out at the absolute worst time, right before a stock takes off. You'll end up taking little tiny profits. Or on the flip side, you'll see a little bitty loss, even though you haven't gotten stopped out. You'll be tempted to take that loss because you can't afford for that loss to get any bigger. Now, obviously, I have an educational business, so I'm a little bit biased. But if you don't have enough money to trade, take what little money you have and put that towards getting educated. It doesn't have to be my stuff. But make sure you are doing that. Now, of course, look at the good, the bad, and the ugly, as I just said, when you're looking at the methodology to make sure it is conceptually correct, make sure it is repeatable in all these other things I preach about. But the money you spend getting educated is going to be far less than the money you will spend trying to get educated through experience. The example I often bring up, someone emailed me for 10 years and I kept telling him, no, this is not how it works. No, you don't do this. No. And after a while, I began thinking this guy is mentally challenged. Well, finally, I just said, look, I'm going to have to cut you off. I can't keep up with your emails. This is very basic stuff that I covered in my first book way back in 2000, 18 years ago, you know? And he's like, oh, I've been meaning to get that. So here's a guy who didn't even bother to read the first book. So you will have to put your time in and you will have to spend a little money on education, but that money will be well spent. We're in the process of moving and I moved boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of books that have accumulated over the years. Some of them are crap and some of them are pretty good. And as I often say, if I get one good idea out of them, then it's all worthwhile. But I invest a lot in my own education. Derek Bott once said, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Now. In a second, I'm going to talk about the fact that I beat the dead horse. It's like, not only do I beat the dead horse, I talk about the fact that I beat the dead horse. I didn't realize it was Einstein that said this until I was putting my slides together, and I took these slides from a presentation that I did several years ago. But Einstein once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. As I've said before, I once asked my wife to take a look at my column and let me know what you think. And she said, well, you say a lot of the same stuff over and over. And so we're saying you beat the dead horse, just like you do in life <laughs> with the girls and with me and everyone else and your family. Well, I do have that propensity. But the reason I have that propensity is because I see many of the same people, in fact, doing the same thing over and over, even though they should do better. And I have a micromanagement example that I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. Now, it's not just for your benefit that I beat the dead horse. It's also for my benefit because just because I decided to become a trader and been doing this for a long, long time, doesn't mean that I'm not still, or doesn't mean that I'm immune to the same psychological propensities and temptations that we all are. L.R. Thomas once said, don't expect trading to fill a hole missing in your life. And I've seen this, I've since seen this said by other traders and psychologists too. But we'll give Miss Thomas credit for it. Now, as I said before, that hole may move throughout your life. And then the other thing I was thinking about this morning is sometimes that hole might just be a small hole, might just be a minor thing. Now, my big hole right now in my life is in 2018 from December to June and six months and one day. I lost both of my parents, who, was a, who I was very close to. You probably often hear me talk about them in these presentations. And I've got to be really careful. My 
my modus operandi, my way of dealing with things is to bury myself in work. Now, if I'm buried into my learning management system and developing content and doing research, that's a very positive thing. And I think that's a good thing. And that's that's really has been part of my salvation through all this. But the other thing where I have to be very careful and I'm having some really big temptations, truth be told, is in my trading. I'm finding myself feeling like I want to get a little aggressive here and there, want to micromanage maybe here and there and do a lot of these things that I preach against. Now, as I said a second ago, that hole doesn't necessarily have to be a big hole, something quite obvious. It could also be something much smaller. I like to go in the house a few minutes for my presentation, grab a glass of water, give the wife a hug. She usually gives me a high five, go knock them dead, babe, you know, break a leg. <laughs> but instead, she was kind of crotchety. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Well, we just got the plans back from the planner. We're building a new house. The plans have been completely rechanged. We meet with the zoning commission tonight for the historical district. The plans have been completely changed. So now I'm thinking, great. Well, I don't know what ramifications this will have. I could see her in the house pouring over them now. But I can guarantee you it's going to cost me money. So how am I going to make that money up in trading? It's like, well, that has nothing to do with trading, Dave. You have to separate that. Now, I'll give you a smaller hole example. I just said she's crotchety. In her defense, she has contracted a disease, which is somewhat prevalent in the third world, but she's got a one in 50 million chance, as do you, of contracting this in the United States. We've seen four doctors so far, and she's been to the ER twice. Now, I think she's on the men. I hope she's on the men, but she did have to go back to the ER last night for some follow-up testing. They, they did have some concerns, and that was just an in and out type of thing, fortunately. Anyway, so needless to say, this has made her a little crotchety. So a couple days ago, I go in the house. We had a little bit of a tiff. But before I went in the house, I noticed that overnight, one of my stocks had gapped up two points. I was feeling pretty smart. Just put the position on, already up two points. I'm feeling like a genius. I was like, hey, that's nice money overnight. Go in the house, have a little tiff. And then I think, oh, well. At least I've got that money in my account. I'm, I'm going to go lock that money in to show how smart I am. Get back to my office, walk up to my screens. Guess what? The stock is not only is no longer up two points, but it's now down two points. So I had this temptation to micromanage myself out of a trade just so I could make some money overnight and look smart to make me feel better. But now I'm at a loss. So now what do I do? Well, of course, like an idiot, I start watching the screens, which I preach against, obviously. Do as I say, not as I do. And then the stock turns right back around, and now I'm up one point. So I got to thinking, okay, up one point. That's not bad overnight. That's good money. Let me lock that in. And then, again, I thought and said, well, Dave, what are you doing? Okay. Wind the clock. Take a minute to wind the clock. Take a minute to breathe. The metaphor that I often use of winding the clock. Greg Morris used to wind the clock when he was in, when he was a pilot in a dangerous situation or even in a simulator to try to calm his nerves a little bit and bypass the amygdala. Easy for me to say, bypass the amygdala to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. So it took me a few seconds to, to calm down and realize that I'm getting ready to make some mistakes in the market that have nothing to do with the market. They have nothing to do with my trading plan. I'm getting ready to micromanage myself out of a trade just so I can look smart and say that I made money overnight. So no matter what happens today, should the TIFF escalate, I made money. I'm smart. Look at me. And then came to my senses, calmed down, and just let the trade unfold. My stop is like eight points away. There's going to be some gyrations. It's a very volatile stock. Just let it all play out. I know, easier said than done. But the point I'm trying to make is 
none of us are immune to these psychological pitfalls of trading. And many times the hole in your life that's missing or the frustration in your life, whatever you want to call it, has nothing to do with trading. So it's very important to separate those two. Now, where am I going with all this? How do you get started towards profitability, consistent profitability? Lao Tzu once said, paraphrasing, a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So for the aspiring trader, and not just the aspiring trader, for the trader who's been trading for a very long time, who just got pissed off at his wife, or whose house plans just changed, or has some other major things that have happened in his life. <laughs> so it's not just for the beginner, it's for all of us. And that's another reason why I beat the dead horse, is sometimes we have to come back and revisit these things, as I've said before. I, this was a good problem to have, actually, but I had put on a bunch of four expositions once, and my wife came in the office, and I said, I'm not sure what to do. Everything's really going well. And she says, well, what would Dave Landry do? Turned on the heel and walked out. It's like, well, what would Dave Landry do? And that's the advantage, the unfair advantage sometimes, of my educational business is, number one, I see a lot of mistakes that are being made. It reminds me not to do them. And number two... It forces me to practice what I preach. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. It forces me to practice what I preach. I don't want to be a hypocrite, like Norm Macdonald talking about. Um, one of his friends says, uh, "And the worst thing about Bill Cosby is he's a hypocrite." And Norm Macdonald's like, "Well, isn't the fact that he drugged women and had sex with them allegedly a a lot worse than being a hypocrite? Seems like hypocrite would be like number ten or number eleven down the line." Anyway. So it does force me to practice what I preach. So what's the first step? I think the first step would have to be on your next trade and only that next trade follow the plan. Now here's the thing, if you could do this on one trade then, as Bella, what's his last name, Caroli I think said, you can do it. Now a lot of people, make fun of me and say, because I'm a coon ass, I sound a lot more like the townie from Waterboy. But all kidding aside, if you can follow the plan for just one trade, you've proven that you could do it, as I'm going to touch upon in a few minutes, as I've beat the dead horse on ad nauseum. It's a process, and the secret to trading is following that process. I know. Easier said than done. Easier said than done when you're pissed off at your wife. Easier said than done when you get hit with some big, huge expense. And that list goes on and on. So, believe it or not, I do have five steps here that I want to talk about. Number one, I will pick the best and leave the rest. Speaking of beating a dead horse, garbage in, garbage out. I often talk about the intertwined nature of technical analysis. I'm sorry, let me rewind that. I often talk about the intertwined nature of mind, money management, and methodology, the three M's, and how you can't separate them out. If you become better at your methodology, your mindset is going to improve. You'll build confidence in your methodology. And then guess what? When you have the unavoidable losing trades, provided, that, of course, they hit your stop, you'll be more inclined to kick the stinkers out of your portfolio because you'll recognize that they aren't winning and you'll recognize that they aren't winners and don't have those characteristics and you'll be more inclined to kick them out. The dichotomy between a winner and a loser will be more and more obvious. So how do you pick the best and leave the rest? That's another one of those cliche things like, okay, Dave, easier said than done. Well, I woke up this morning thinking, how could I give you a crash course in stock selection? 
Now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about a few things that you should look for. And obviously, to cover stock selection completely would take a little bit longer. I took 14 hours to cover stock selection in the stock selection course, which I'll probably be redoing over the next year or so to make it part of the learning management system. I'll, I'll be editing it much sooner, but hopefully completely re-record it. Nothing has really changed in it, except maybe I've learned a few more things, but it needs to be freshened up a little bit. The technology then, or I should say my own technology is a lot better. So it's going to be hard for me to teach stock selection in a few minutes, but this is the point I'm trying to get to, believe it or not, I have one. If you come to these weekend chart shows or go in and watch the archives, especially once I started preaching this, I found that everybody I have found that everyone's stock selection has gotten a lot better. But if you go in and look at some of the older shows, the few little things I preach here today or going to preach here today, a lot of people make those mistakes. So let's talk about that. The first thing is. You don't want your stock to look like an electrocardiogram. Believe it or not, and I need to do a better job of archiving these things, but this was an actual stock I was sent. The stock is all over the place. It's a Jackie Mason stock. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's sideways. So I'm not sure whether they wanted to buy the stock. I think they did or what, but as you can see, the stock is all over the place. You want to ideally look for persistency, and as I've said before, Persistency could be somewhat longer term, let's say 20 days or so. But I've also been amazed, and through teaching, again, my unfair advantage, I've learned a lot about things that I've discovered, such as persistency. For instance, when I was in Italy, as I've said before, my first trip to Italy, the, sh the trade shows back then were huge. This was right before the, um, the market tanked seriously, and there still was a lot of money flying around. And I forget exactly how, I say the screen's 30 feet. I'm not sure exactly how big it was. But if you look on my Facebook page or look under somewhere on my website, I got a picture of me in front of it. I'm tiny and I'm six foot tall, so you could do the math. But it's at least a 20-something foot screen. And I turned around and looked at the screen as I'm pointing something out. And I noticed that over a short period of time, when each one of these bars are two or three feet each, that over a short period of time, persistency is very important too. Now, persistency just means that a stock tends to go up day after day after day after day. Mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression by drawing a line through as many bars as possible. But you know me, I just try to keep it simple by drawing a line through as many bars as possible. So persistency is something you want to look for. You want to look for acceleration and not deceleration in a chart. Now, a lot of times you'll see a chart and you'll look at the longer term net net, which we're going to talk about in one second. And you'll say, well, wait a minute, Dave, look at this uh, big blue arrow. I guess in this case is black. This stock has gone up quite a bit. Well, yeah, but it's also lost some momentum and might actually be rolling over. So instead, you want to make sure the stock is accelerating higher and not losing steam. Now, speaking of net-net, is the market higher? Is the market lower? Or is the market pretty much unchanged? By market, it could be anything, okay? It could be stocks, it could be Bitcoin, it could be Forex, whatever you want to trade. Now, does the market tend to stair-step higher? Thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, rinse and repeat. Okay. If the stock, and I'll use this word stock and market interchangeably, but if the stock has illustrated it has the propensity to go up, pull back, go back, go up, pull back, then maybe it might be able to do it one more time. And hopefully, I know we should never say hope in this business more than just once as opposed to a stock thrusting, pull back, thrusting, and then pulling back below its last area of thrust. 
Now, if you're looking at something like a base breakout, first pullbacks after a base breakout, or one of my favorite patterns, and I guess I need to watch how I say that because it seems like every pattern is one of my favorite patterns, but it's a pretty good pattern, and there's two ways this happens. One, sometimes it could be at very low levels, and that creates what I call the Phoenix strategy. Let's see if I can fix my mouse here. I lost my mouse. Talk about yourselves. Where'd it go? Oh, here we go. So this could be two things. One, this is this is kind of like it could be at a high level. You get a big base, then it takes off. And as I've said before, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. To give credit, I think I thought I was the first person that came up with that. I just I've just been proofing Linda Rasky's book, and I think she said Akin Poro or somebody else said that long before I did. Now, it could be two ways. One, it could be at high levels, as I've kind of illustrated here. could also be a big, long, long, long-term bottom. And this is what I call a Phoenix strategy. You get a bow tie or a first thrust or something like this, kind of a saucer and handle type of bottom. So you want to see that breakout and subsequent pullback. You don't want that subsequent pullback to come back below the breakout levels. I get asked about, believe it or not, a lot of stocks that had great breakouts but have already come 100% back in. Around, they've already round tripped and people are looking to buy. No, let that stock prove itself before looking to take new action. Now, when I talk about trend, and I think these are in the first, the trend that is, first four videos of trading full circle, which are 100% free, and you can get them in about a week. Let me see, I got seven days and 20 more hours to launch, hopefully. But you can get those in about a week in the learning management system for free, or in the meantime, you can get them on my website. I think there's a few links. If you click on the home page, you can get those first four videos free from trading full circle. And I think in those videos, I talk about trend qualifiers. If not, I'll show you, if you email me, I'll show you how to get my books for free to where, so you can go in and read about it in the layman's guide, to trading stocks and my other books. The trend qualifiers are things like gaps and laps and wide range bars in the direction of the trend. And you want to avoid stocks that have gaps against the trend now unless it's a commodity related stock which tend to, tends to gap around a little bit and the gap is small no big deal with a commodity related stock or if it's a foreign stock where it trades overnight then it's okay to ignore the gap i'll give you one other caveat if it's a super duper duper volatile stock and let's say the gap is really tiny you have to squint your eyes to see it then maybe that's okay as a general statement especially when it comes to the actual setup itself you want to avoid stocks that have a gap against the setup. There's, there might be something wrong here, okay? And as I alluded to a minute ago, you want to look for trend qualifiers, such as wide range bars and direction of trends, strong closes, gaps, laps, and then things such as acceleration, persistency, et cetera. So avoid those that have, again, gaps against the setup. Now, here's another really biggie. This is probably one of the most common mistakes that I see people make. They look at the chart over here, and it looks fantastic. But if you look back in time, if you look to the left of the chart, and by the way, if you find a broker that lets you trade off the left side of the chart, please let me know. But if you look at the left of the chart, you'll see things like overhead supply. Well, what happens is, these little bars in here, this little trading I've illustrated in here is not some magical little squiggles on the chart. These were people who actually traded that stock or other market at that level. Now it's human nature to look to get off, off the hook. It's human nature to look to get out of break even. It's human nature to look to get off the hook. So if you buy this stock down here somewhere, let's say you trigger in here, then the most you can get out of that position before it gets into possible trouble will be the move that I have illustrated here at 2, 
up toward that trading because again, people will look to get off the hook. Now, I realize I've only spent a few minutes on stock selection, but if you could do these few things, okay, I would be willing to say nine out of 10 times, I think it's a pretty good estimate, people will send me setups, potential setups, or bring them up in the weekend charts. And if I don't like them, I'd be willing to bet nine out of 10 times it's something that I just illustrated you to you in this slide, this one little slide. Okay, number two, I will plan my trade ahead of time. Again, you know, I don't, I don't know why I'm going through this big confession with you guys today, but I am so guilty of being tempted to do something. I come into my office, I see these markets moving, I want to jump in. It's like, well, wait a minute, Dave. You didn't, this is not part of your analysis, why you just want to jump in. So I have to throttle myself back. I have to resist that temptation. As I preach, busy traders make good traders because they're not firing off day trader. Excuse me, let me rewind that. Busy traders, as I preach, busy traders make good traders because they're not firing off day traders, they're not micromanaging. They're busy saving lives, building buildings, or doing other great things. Well, other great things, at least in my mind, is working on my educational business or doing research or something like that and keeping my damn hands off the mouse unless it's absolutely necessary or unless there's some action that needs to be taken. So if you come in and you think you see an opportunity, well, number one, why didn't you see it ahead of time? And number two, ask yourself, or are you just looking to fire off an unnecessary trade? So the planning phase is really pretty simple. You're going to have an entry. You're going to have a stop. The entry, you need to give the stock a little bit of wiggle room or whatever other market you're trading. This has become more and more important in more recent times. So let's say you have, and again, a lot of dead horse speeding here, but just bear with me. I see these problems over and over. So let's say you've got a little pullback. In the old days, you used to be able to get in right there, right above that high. But since then, what's happened, the market maker tends to bring it up, and then you get triggered into a piece of crap. So now you give it a little bit of wiggle room, and you're going to be amazed that by giving it a little bit of wiggle room. And again, in more recent times, it's become bigger and bigger. And there's a trade-off between wiggle room and too far. Obviously, we're still trying to catch this reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend. So you can't enter way up here. That makes you a breakout trader and you miss this whole reversion to the mean move. So it's tricky, but you have to give it enough room so you don't trigger a noise alone, but not so much room that you give up this reversion to the mean move in the direction of the trend. Now, I have spent many presentations on stop placement. There's a couple of questions you have to ask yourself. Well, the first and foremost one would be, where would I be wrong as a trend follower? Now, without re-giving these presentations, which would take a while, if you're trading something at low levels, let's say something bases out, you get a little pullback, a little bow tie, whatever, you get long, you want this to go up, right? You want to trade with the trend. Well, if it comes back in and makes brand new lows, then you are wrong and you have to get out. So the first question is, where would you be wrong? The second question is, how much room do I have to give that position to withstand the normal volatility of the market? And I hate to even bring it up. I've said it so many times. I'm sick of myself saying it. But there's a popular method out there that says that you should use a fixed stop, a fixed percentage on all stocks. Well, I think it's 8%. I have... I almost just said, pardon my back. I'm looking over at my screen to see what stocks that I'm in have moved 8% already this morning. And it's we're only, what, a couple hours into the trading day. 
I can all but guarantee if you use an 8% stop on some of the stocks that I like to trade, some of the stocks I recommend you trade, some of these momentum stocks, you're going to get stopped out on noise alone. So you have to ask yourself two things. How do I survive the short-term volatility of the market? And where would I be wrong? Surviving the short-term volatility is key because what we're going to do is we're going to make that transition to the longer-term trader, provided we do survive that short-term volatility and provided it does move in our favor, we're going to take that swing trade out at the initial profit target. Initial profit target, without going into a whole money management lesson, pretty simple. It's just a mathematical calculation. It's the entry minus the protective stop, and that's it. That's going to be your initial profit target. Now, your secondary target is unlimited. You want the market to go on forever. You want to follow that trend. I should say you want to follow that trend forever. You don't want to exit early. How much is enough? It's never enough because you'll lose plenty of money trading. So you've got to grab that tiger by the tail and hang on. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes too. And then your trailing stop. Now, initially, your trailing stop is sort of a one-for-one one thing. Stock goes up one point. You trail it up one point. But once you hit that initial profit target, you begin to let that widen out. And as I said before, in more recent years, I've become a little bit more liberal with that trailing stop earlier in the trade. Stock goes up, let's say, 25 cents or half a point. Depends on the price of stock, obviously. But I might just leave that trailing stop where it is. On the first loaf, that is. Now, here's a biggie, and this is kind of going back into, this is actually a subset of your planning your trade and following a plan. But I will wait for an entry, and this is a mistake that I see over and over and over and over again. And again, I'm beating the dead horse, and I've told the story at nauseam, but I'll get emails all the time. Hey, Dave, I'm down 50% in that turd you recommended. And I'm like, well, I agree with you. It's a turd, but I never recommended it. Me thinking that I recently recommended it. Not that everything I, done, not that everything I recommend works. But anyway, I'll look at the chart and say, there's no way I would recommend the stock. And it's like, yes, you did. We'll go back a few times. And then I'll say, well, give me the date. And they'll give me the date. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I see it right there. That's a beautiful TKO. That looks fantastic. What do we just talk about? Persistency? Beautiful. Check. Okay. Shorter term persistency. Check. Net net price move. Check. Okay. This thing looks fantastic. But what happens? The stock never triggered. It just implodes. I am shocked after, even after being at this, in this business for a long, long time, I'm shocked at the number of bad trades you can avoid simply by waiting for an entry. I get emails all the time from people who front run setups. Now, I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but if we get into a crazy, crazy rip-roaring bull market, then there are some cases where you might look to get in a little early, but you're still waiting for a bit of a trigger. But as a general statement, you want to see that stock trigger an entry. Now, it's hard to quantify this, and I can't really figure out an equation that could help you quantify this because you're simply avoiding it. But not putting the capital, not putting capital in the harm's way is huge to your longer term success. So let's say you do end up with a position that goes against you, and let's say it just goes against you for your 2% or whatever. Well, now you got to make 2% and change on your next trade just to make up for that loss because what happens with drawdowns, they grow geometrically. The bigger problem that I see with this is that you have shown or proved by example that you can't follow the plan. So you can't get a little bit pregnant, right? So what are the chances of you stopping out at just that 2%? Probably slim and none. And as a trade used to work with said years ago, slim just left town. 
So you may be emailing me six months from now when it's down 50% and we go through that little stupid little <laughs> banter back and forth. So very, very simple thing. Wait for an entry. Big problem. A lot of people have problems doing it. I am tempted to do it all the time. I just set up a big, huge monitor that I'm just going to use as my trading station, so to speak. I've got it on a fixed standing desk, which at least forces me, if I don't use my regular stand-up desk enough during the day, at least when I go to place a trade, I have to stand up. So I'm at least standing up a few times a day to either place a trade or at least look at the markets, okay? But the problem is I kind of in more recent years have forced myself to watch a screen less to avoid the micromanagement, but now I'm kind of getting that trading station set up and it's kind of a new toy. I've got a new brokerage or one new brokerage I'm using and it's got some bells and whistles and I'm kind of messing around with it and I'm redoing my equipment in my office. So I've got to be careful not to, and I want to do things like I'm feeling that temptation. I want to jump in ahead of time. I'm setting up some new accounts. It's like I want to immediately make those accounts profitable. And I am not immune to all of these temptations. But what do I do? Well, let me grab the clock. The clock is now over the trading station. But I wind the clock. And tell myself, Dave, you are violating the rules. Just follow the plan. I know. Easier said than done. So just to reiterate on entries, we are waiting for a market to pull back as a general statement from most of the setups. And something like a bow tie or first thrust, it may not be much of a pullback. But in a generic pullback, a persistent pullback, or TKO, we're looking for that market to swing down to oversold. But we're not going to try to play that bounce by catching the falling knife. We're going to actually wait for a resumption of trends. And one of the recent presentations I was working on, I was talking about the human nature, how it doesn't really apply to markets, how it's, you have to do the hard thing. And the human nature is we like bargains. I love bargains. We all love bargains, don't we? But when you go to buy a stock or a currency or whatever, you're not trying to catch that falling knife. I know there are methods that do that. I strongly urge you not to trade those type of methods because that'll work until it don't. But without digressing too far, you're not going to get a bargain when you go in to enter if you are a trend follower. And by the way, as I preach, I don't know why I sound like Jackie Mason, the only way to ever make money on a trade is to capture a trend. So why not be a trend follower all the time? Now, before I will see the position to its fruition, and this is just on your your next trade, on one trade, right? And Nike, and not micromanage. I've done complete presentations just on micromanagement. So in other words, I will follow the plan. Now, again, why do I beat the dead horse? Why do I say the same things over and over again? Well, because no matter how many times I say them, human nature rears its ugly head. And again, I think I've kind of explained throughout this presentation, I'm not immune to that human nature. Here's an open trade. We had a buy. Okay. Went up like the next day. I was like, hey, that's not too bad. And then what happens? Well, it went down and it's been underwater for about a month. Finally, the thing breaks out, takes off, hits the initial profit target, gaps higher, nice, nice move higher, expansion range higher. What happens? Well, on that opening gap, I get an email. I sold ARWR yesterday. This is from someone who knows better, who's a pretty good trader, who I've watched over the years just get better and better and better. But guess what? That psychology rears its ugly head, that human nature, that propensity to micromanage. 
if we want to get deep into this, why did he do this? Well, because as I have preached, the propensity to avoid pain is a much stronger emotion than a gain. So, especially if it's similar size gains and losses. So when you have a loss, your emotional reaction, and this has been measured on a dopamine level, is at least two times greater than the pleasure from a similar size gain. So without calling him up and finding out, I'm 99% sure that he felt the pain of this position going against him and he did not want that pain to increase. Pain is a very big motivator. And we will lose a lot of money as traders trying to avoid pain. So follow the process. And it is a process. Pick the best. Leave the rest. Plan your trade. I know, easier said than done. Ask yourself, where will you be wrong? You probably wonder, why don't you turn your phone off? It's like, well, you know, <laughs> if a broker's calling me and I'm in a lot of trouble, I want to know. So, again, plan your trade. Ask yourself, where will you be wrong? And then you have to accept that. As I often say, the secret to trading, the secret to life is making decisions and living with them. As I often joke at my wife's expense, marrying the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life was a pretty easy decision. Living with her is not. I've been asking her to help me with this learning management system, and she hasn't gotten around to doing it. So... I could put these little jokes in here knowing that she's not going to help me. And if she does, well, woof, I'll deal with that. So where are you going to take partial profits? And you have to accept it if that's all. As I say quite often, keep it with my mantra of beating a dead horse today. When we have positions that look like this and like this, and we get that initial partial profit and we stop out of the scratch, the initial partial profit, stop out of the scratch. I forget exactly when, but a few years ago, we had like 10 of these in a row. My percent correct was like 90% correct, which is unusual for trend following, really unusual. But you know what? I'd rather be 10% correct and make a lot of money than 90% correct and make a little money. Well, a lot of clients started emailing me, Dave, why don't we just take 100% at that initial profit target? Well, if you take that full position off, you're never going to capture the big winner. And that big winner, that big outlier, and I know I make it sound a little elusive, but that big outlier is key. One or two will make your year. So you have to accept it if that's all you get. Now, you have to accept it if it's, if it's much more. So that's a good problem to have. But a lot of people are very much inclined to sell out here or somewhere along the lines, somewhere down the line. Well, if you sell out at 100%, you're never going to make 200%. And if you sell at 200%, you'll never make 400%. And if you sell out at 400%, you'll never make 800% and so on and so forth. But Dave, how, many, how often does it go up 80%? Well, not that often. But you need to be there for when it does. As I often say, you must be present to win. Well, that's two ways of being present. One, you have to be there when that big opportunity comes along. And number two, you might have to just sit on your hands and let that longer term trend unfold. So in addition to once you take that partial profit, how are you going to trail that stop? And again, the secret sauce to trading, at least my methodology, because short-term trading has its problems and longer-term trading has its problems. Linda Rasky and I have been going back and forth a little bit because I've been working on her book with her, or looking through her book, I should say, proofing it for her, not working on it, but proofing it. And 
I'm not a huge fan of pure short-term trading, and she's pretty much a short-term trader. And we kind of going back and forth a little bit, but she said something that made a lot of sense. It's like the short-term trading versus long-term trading is like God's way of handing a trader a card with the word over printed on both sides. And I thought that was a brilliant way of putting it. So it's like, okay, you're right. There's no need for us to, to argue over this. And I don't want to digress too far, but I will say this. I think Linda is a bit of an aberration when it comes to short-term trading. Uh, and you do get whacked quite a bit. Her book is not out yet. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a phenomenal book. And I would strongly urge you to read it. If you go to books to read on my website, daylander.com slash books dash two dash read. As soon as it's available, I will have a link to it there. And I'd strongly urge you to read it. Anyway, how will you trail that stop? And that's going to be pretty easy. A lot of times there's nothing to do with trailing a stop. And other times, as I've said before, there's two things you could do. There's two games you can play. One is called keep the change. Stock goes up a little bit, say half a point on a $40 stock or 50 cents, whatever. I'd say half a point. Uh, don't do anything. Let that stop widen out a little bit. Keep the change, okay? And if it makes a big move, let's say three points, then maybe just bump your stop up two points, thereby widening the stop out a point. Again, all this is covered in money management. But I'm just giving you a thumbnail today on this. Now, a lot of times, there's nothing to do in the markets. And sometimes the easiest thing to do is turn off your screens. I have placed my orders for today. And luckily, I have this show, so I'm not going to be tempted to <laughs> micromanage myself, at least over this hour or so that I'm doing this show. But sometimes the best thing to do is turn off your screens and, as a client once said, find something more interesting to do. Go spend some time with some loved ones, okay, or enjoy a hobby or do something other than stare at the screen. As Dakota said before, having a screen on your desk is like having a slot machine sitting on your desk. You're going to be inclined to feed it. Don't. Now, the more and more work I do on the educational side, the more and more important I realize that a postmortem, the more and more I realize how important a postmortem is. So you need to do, and I put in bold letters there, capitalized letters, an honest postmortem on every trade, focusing on the process, not the outcome. But it worked, didn't it? Okay, five dangerous words. And I've been guilty of that too, doing stupid things and then saying it worked, didn't it? Okay, very, very, very dangerous words. And a lot of people have told me that in the past. I've been guilty myself. So be really, really careful that you're focused on the process and following that process and not the outcome of the event. I've been doing a lot of research on outcome bias. It's uh, Tversky and Kahneman, I hope I'm saying his name right, have done a lot of work on that. And I read the Undoing Project recently, talk a little bit about outcome bias. Annie Duke's book pretty much completely talks about outcome biases and more importantly, overcoming them. And the secret there is separating luck from skill. Well, good luck in doing that because it's not the easiest thing in the world. But if you're looking carefully at that trade and you go back to that stock selection slide we talked about earlier and said, okay, well, it was an persistent trend or accelerating trend. We had trend qualifiers and direction of trend. Net net move was good, had a pretty cool setup. I waited for the entry. I took the entry. I placed a stop. I got stopped out. So be it. I followed the process, okay, rinse and repeat. What I've been saying throughout this presentation, just the one thing is follow the plan, follow the process for just one trade. So be very careful with that outcome bias. 
as I preach ad nauseum, keeping with my with my <laughs> theme today of beating a dead horse, the market could be a really bad teacher. So if you're looking at that bottom line, I know people say the bottom line is the bottom line, and yeah, some truth to that. But on any given trade, the bottom line is not the bottom line. If you did something stupid, bad decisions can lead to good outcomes, and good decisions can lead to bad outcomes. And that's kind of that paradox you got to wrap your head around as a trader. So look at the process. If you follow the process right, then pat yourself on the back and say, next. And the other big thing in that post-mortem is, as I often say, look at the trade, back the chart out to the day before you took the trade. And honestly ask yourself, if I was seeing this trade tomorrow, would I take it again? If you could say yes, then congratulations. You have, you have graduated. You're no longer a grasshopper, right? And as I've said quite a bit in the past, a lot of times I found myself thinking, what in the hell was I thinking when I look back at the trade? It was choppy or the trend wasn't confirming and all of those other things or many of those other things I talked about on the stock selection slide a few minutes ago just simply weren't there. And it, it was, as they say in Market Wizards, into wishing and not intuition. The true enlightenment is when you start reaching the point where you say, what the hell was I thinking? And then your next level to take that one step beyond is when you find yourself saying that less and less. So you have to be brutally honest. You have to do that introspection. It's really a journey, not so much of discovering the markets, which is obvious and blatant, but it's more a journey within. It's more a journey of discovering yourself doing these things that feel a little unnatural, and a lot of them are unnatural, okay? We are taught in life, you do something, you make money, that's a good thing, right? Well, not always, because sometimes doing the wrong thing will cost you a lot of money. If you fall into those bad habits, it's going to be really hard to break them. So again, not to be cliche, pick the best, leave the rest, plan your trade, trade your plan, and obviously do a post-mortem, rinse and repeat. So do that on one trade, just one trade, your next one trade, and then rinse and repeat. One thing I'm thinking about doing is I'd like to, once I get this learning management system launched, I'd like to take it to the next level, get an elite group of you guys, and let's just knock the cover off the ball. Let's take it one step beyond. And maybe a small step in getting towards... Uh, to, maybe a small step towards achieving that goal would be to let's all submit a trade and prove that we are going to do exactly as we planned and we are going to accept the outcome, good, bad, or indifferent. All right, lots of pontification today. Any questions on anything so far? And let's go ahead and open it up for stock picks, and then I'll get to the markets here in just one second. So, again, on the next trade, just do these five things and then rinse and repeat for the next thousand trades. Now, I want to talk real quickly about a good problem to have. And I was a little mixed about whether or not I should talk about this because I don't want to make it look like salt in the wounds or the fish that got away. But I did have this stock on my lander list and I did have a client that took it. And that was quite a risky trade, a little bit outside the core methodology, more of an IPO type of setup. So I didn't actually put it as an official setup in my core trading service, but it was in the Landry list. And I did have a client that emailed me about this yesterday. Now this is the was the first deep retracement, and it was also the five Dave Light IPO setup that we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about trading IPOs. So 
couple of things were there. Again, not to make it look like the fish got away or anything like that, just to show you what's possible. And if you chip away at it, eventually another one of these TLRYs will come along. The question was sent to me on this one. Ignore this graphic over here. So the question was sent to me like, hey, Dave, this thing's going to have a big gap open. What do I do? Should I exit all my shares? Well, Linda Rasky once said, feed the ducks when they're quacking. So I do feel a little bit of that. But what I would recommend you do, even though it's going to be tough, is, yes, sell out a piece of your shares because you already took partial profits. You already took half way back here. So sell out a piece of the trade, but make sure you keep a piece on. So let's say you got 200 shares left, then sell out 200 shares way up here when the stock's 50 points, 75 points, whatever that open was, 100 points higher. I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at. 100 points on a stock, that's not bad. So it's okay to sell out a piece of that trade. Just make sure you keep a piece on in case this stock goes up 100 points tomorrow, the next day, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I don't know, Donald. Did you say this before? I think um, I don't know if this came up while I was talking or not. But Donald says TLRY case study into a very successful IPO thus far. Anyway, regret regrettably, my skepticism on this cannabis stock caused me to pass on the trade, and now it's likely way too late to join the party. Yeah. You know, that's a thing, and and uh, I didn't even realize it was a cannabis stock when I had it on my list. And I actually had a client email me telling me, yeah, it's another one of those weed stocks, and he's a doctor, and he's been really paying attention to all of them. He's kind of fascinated with it all. But that's the thing. you got to be careful, as I say with IPOs, what's the story of fad or glory? Yes. Are these weed stocks a fad? Probably. Are they a bubble? Probably. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But it's not for us to judge. I played the Bitcoin bubble a while back, worked out pretty good, and then the bubble burst. Well, through money management, I was able to keep the lion's share of the profits, or nearly the lion's share, I should say. Gave up a lot in the end. But that's trend following, okay? But yeah, it's hard to close your eyes and do the right thing, especially when you as a human, have the propensity to interject logic. Does it make sense? No. Okay. But sometimes it's worth a shot. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. There's a couple things I want to flesh out in here. Keep the stock picks coming. I'd be happy to uh, get them to you. Oh, good question. Somebody's asked me for where an entry should be. That's a great question. All right, first of all, if you go back in, a few weeks back, and even before that, even further back, I did some presentations on simple market timing. Every now and then I'll come back to market timing overall. And then if you look on my website, I have an article I did for Proactive Trader Magazine, and they titled it Technical Analysis as Easy as ABC. And my point is that if a market's going to go to C, it's going to have to pass through B on its way to C. And if it's going to go beyond C, not to be confused with Beyonce, then as long as it stays above B, then stay long. Now, where's A, where's B, where's C? That's open for debate, but that depends on the volatility of the underlying instrument. For the, I'm doing the Jackie Mason thing again, I don't know why, but... For the S&P 500, I did a little research here, and I determined that 10% would be a good round number. So as long as the market is within 10% of its all-time highs, then stay long. Now, nothing's perfect, okay? Back here, we had a whipsaw with the system, okay? It said, get out. Well, what's the old hedge fund adage? He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So you get out the way. As Greg Moore says, 
Whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So that was a whipsaw. Ironically, I think Greg Morris actually got whipsawed out in his own system market timing, which is a lot more in depth than my market timing. And we talked about this before, but Greg was running five to eight billion dollars and he was trading mostly ETFs. So the market timing was a lot more advanced and there's a lot more things that he was doing. And I just, you know me, I just like to keep it simple. Look at the charts. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? And in this particular case, how far away is it from all-time highs? Well, give it the benefit of the doubt if you're at or near all-time highs. Whatever I've been preaching lately, give it, the give it the benefit of the doubt, okay? Occasionally, I'm in these weekly shows with Timing Research as the host, and I noticed in the last show, somebody said, I want to see the track record for all these predictions. Well, I'd be willing to bet you'd be pretty impressed with my track record on all these predictions because as long as the market is at or new high, near new highs, I'm saying it's going higher. Okay? So go back in and look at any show from here. I guarantee you I was bullish. Okay? Might have been bearish in here somewhere probably. And then somewhere around here I've been bullish. So I've been bullish for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Why? Because I'm the grand poobah? No. Because the market is within 10% of its all-time highs. And especially if it's within spitting distance of its all-time highs. And that's why a few days ago, the market sold off a little bit. Yes, I dropped an F-bomb. Yes, I'm still human. But I stayed the course. Why? Because it's not too far away from its all-time highs. And I know, and I think it's a Bill Dunn quote. I used to give Covell credit for it, but I'm pretty sure it's Bill Dunn. That holding on to the bouncing Bronco, Bill Dunn said, trend following is like riding a bouncing Bronco. And it is. It's the market's job, so to speak, is to shake you out. And in some cases, with like something like the TKO, we actually use that to our advantage, that propensity to our advantage. But here we have S&P breaking out to all-time highs. Will it stay there? I don't know. But so far, so good. We're up three quarters percent today. All-time highs. Do not argue with the longer-term trend. Don't fight the tape, as they say. Now, let's take a look at NASDAQ. What's the NASDAQ doing? Well, looking pretty good. Let's measure it. That's the all-time high right there. Back in August, we're a percent and change away from all-time highs. One good afternoon would put us back to brand new highs. So let's err on the side of the longer-term trend. What's the Rusty doing? Well, Rusty's up a little bit more than a half percent. Not setting the world on fire, but not a bad day nonetheless. So far, so good. Let's take a measurement here. What are we going to do? We're going to stay long. How long will we stay long? As long as the market is at or near all-time highs. I'm overseeing some portfolios now, which are pre-existing portfolios, which are mostly, I would say, you know, the mutual funds, but they're related to the S&P 500 because most of these mutual fund guys, what do they do? I talked to a guy in the industry once and he said, Dave, let me tell you how it works. They come across as a stock picker, but they're not. What they do is they figure out what stocks they need to buy to mimic the performance in the S&P 500 and a very tiny part of their portfolio, enough to sweep under the rug if they have to, goes into actual stock picking. So I'm pretty sure that these portfolios that I'm looking over, overseeing, are going to act, and so far they've been true to form, they're going to act a lot like the S&P 500. In the money manager's defense, if you do about the same as the S&P 500, you're probably not going to lose your job. But if you go out on a limb, pick some stocks, and you underperform the S&P 500, then you're going to be in a world of hurt. And I've felt that hurt a little bit in more recent years because the mechanical portfolio hasn't performed exceptionally well relative to the S&P 500. Now, I've been in the hunt of a lot of good stocks and a lot of clients have done really well because I've put these stocks in front of them. But to try to make it work mechanically, because the market has not gone up in a straight line, it hasn't worked that well. But again, you're not going to lose your job as a portfolio manager if you're just mirroring the S&P 500. For instance, take a look at this, okay? That's a pretty serious slide. We got knocked out of all our longs. Well, what's happening now? The market's at brand new highs. 
go in and look at those longs. And if we were still long those, probably most of them would be much, much higher than they were. But you have to get out of the way. Sooner or later, buying and holding will no longer work. And then that's where the trader is going to really come out on top. All right. The couple sectors in here, energy is still sideways at best. Again, draw your sideways arrows. Look at the net net change. But over the last week or so, they've been improving, but they're still stuck at a range. So wait for them to get out of range before doing anything. Metals and mining are pushing higher in here, but so far it looks like they're still in trouble. So I wouldn't rush out and buy any metals at this juncture. Banks are kind of all over the place with this gap down not that long ago. They're pushing higher today, which is a good thing. But they're kind of wide and loose and all over the place. Now, one thing that's been pretty good in here and kind of cool is like some of these areas that have been sideways and choppy are beginning to improve again, such as insurance. Manufacturing is a big one. You can see it's been all over the place. And if you go in and look at the service archives, you'll see over the past several months, I've been saying, I kind of see these areas that have underperforming as the glass half full because the market's near all-time highs or at all-time highs. So let's err on the side of the longer-term trend, right? As I just said. And the fact that some sectors aren't doing that well, well, let's keep an eye on those sectors and let's see if any more sectors join in the fray. But the fact that most other sectors are doing pretty good, maybe these sectors will be what's needed to help push those indices higher. Now, it's a little counterintuitive, and I don't want to talk about both sides of my mouth, but let's say every sector was headed higher as the overall market was. Well, then what's left to push the market even higher, okay? So that was my point there about seeing it as, as glass half full. Now, obviously, some areas like retail have been doing pretty good in here, pulling back in here a little bit recently. It looks like it wants to go up to new highs. There's your persistency, so that's a good-looking chart there. Transports, I'm not a huge fan of Dow Theory. Some people follow it still. I can't really argue with it. It doesn't seem like it's that crazy of a methodology, but right here at all-time highs or darn near close. A lot of technology, as you would expect, with the NASDAQ hanging in, there, hanging in there, doing pretty good, such as software. And let's take a look at the semi. Semi's score is a bit of a bummer because they're just all over the place. Now, today, they're having a pretty good day. Ideally, I like to see some follow-through. As I said a minute ago, some people like to watch the transports. I like to watch the semis. I haven't done any type of analysis longer term, and I know some other people who have, but... I think the bottom line is when the semis confirm, you have a pretty good market. And not that you have a bad market when the semis aren't confirming, but it certainly helps to have the semis confirm what you're seeing in the overall market. And some people argue, well, that's your new, that's your new transport. It's a data highway now as opposed to a physical highway. With such a long bull market in our corporate and government debt issues, how nervous should we be? I don't know. What's the market doing? Well, let's take a look at the S&P 500. Well, I'll tell you what. As long as the market's at all-time highs, you don't have to worry about it, okay? Now, I know I'm being a little facetious. What I'm saying is there's always something to worry about. Don't confuse the issue with facts. I was in a webinar recently. Guy was super bearish for possibly such reasons, okay? I know he doesn't like the government, okay? Like it or not, what is, is, unless you're Bill Clinton, of course. So, yeah, all these things are going to be in the back of your mind, but don't worry about them, okay? Worry about following your plan. So my plan is as long as the S&P 500, there's a few other caveats too, but as long as the S&P 500 is within 10% of its all-time highs, I'm not going to get too excited. Okay. Now on a more micro level, as long as my stock does not get stopped out, I will stay with that position. Okay. Now, Truth be told, I'm looking at my portfolio. I'm starting to gather a few positions. I put in another order today for a new stock. 
And I got to thinking, I sure would like to see some of these stocks in my portfolio or more of the stocks in my portfolio, I should say, hit that initial profit target. I like taking risk off, okay? I hate when you're putting it on, putting it on, putting it on, <laughs> you know, and nothing is coming off. I like to have a little bit of an ebb and flow where it's like, okay, I locked in profits on this position. Now worst thing can happen to me barring overnight is I stop out at a free position. The game, as I often say, the game you want to play is accumulate as many free positions as possible. I don't have as many free positions right now as I would like in my portfolio. So yeah, I'm a little nervous about that. I wouldn't say nervous, I'd say concerned might be a better way of phrasing that. And by the way, your phraseology is really important when it comes to markets, okay? In life too, for that matter. That's why I try to say I got into a little tiff with my wife. She's a little miffed, you know, I'm trying not to say she's pissed. <laughs> okay, the question is ALB. Well, I hear you shorter term, it's beginning to move higher, but it's not a setup. And then what did we talk about earlier? You got a little bit of overhead supply here. And then what do you have back here? You've got a big gap against the trend. So what's going to happen is this stock rallies much further. Some people are going to likely look to get out at break even. Okay. It's also not set up. And again, you've got a gap. So I would avoid that one. EA for an entry. Good question. Let's see. Okay. What do you want to do with this? You want to buy this? Okay. What did I say earlier? Come to the weekend charts. And then now I don't want to pick on you. If this is your first time here, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying that people who know better ask me about stocks. So this is headed down. So if you're looking to short this, then no problem. But if you're looking to go long, why would you look to go long as a trend follower, a stock that's going straight down? So no on that one. And if you're looking to a short, let me know. We'll come back and take another look at it. But I'll tell you this, even though I've seen some shorts here and there, What's what do we do when the market is at or near new highs? We err on the side of longer term trend. Now, in 2008, the S&P was making marginal new highs. It was trading sideways, had lost some momentum, and I couldn't find a long setup to save my life, as I've said quite a bit. And I found one or two shorts, actually one short, then I found another one, then I found another one, and we started putting them on because that's all we had. We didn't get crazy bearish, okay, but we listened to the database, and the database was producing only shorts and no longs, so we did start taking those short setups, and eventually, by early 2008, we were fully short, or at least 100% of the portfolio was short, and that's just from following along as a trend follower. But right now, I don't think we're in that market. As long as that S&P is banging on new highs, especially with vigor like today, Air on the side of longer term trim. Okay, RNET. All right, well, this one has taken off in here. What's wrong with my computer today? And it's kind of going straight up and it's doubled over a short period of time. So it's a pretty serious run. Uh, it's not bad. Let's zoom in and take a look at the micro here. From a micro perspective, it looks pretty good. Okay. That stock selection screen or slide that we talked about a little while ago, what did I say? Well, you want acceleration we got acceleration well you want persistency we got it persistence okay and then of course you want to pull back so this looks pretty much textbooks in nature one thing i'm noticing here this is a really 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 thin stock one thing with technical analysis you have to be careful is you have to make sure you have a representative sample so as a private trader you could trade this stock and it's probably liquid enough to make technical analysis work but just realize that it's really, really thin, okay? So this looks pretty good. The only concern that I have here is wide and loose, longer term, it's kind of all over the place. That combined with the fact that it's thin, I would pass on that particular stock, but I hear you. If it wasn't so thin and longer term, if it wasn't kind of all over the place, this is almost textbook in nature as to what a setup should look like, okay? So good eye on that one, Donald. Good job. Um, high five. I mean, I'll give you a high five, except the volume and longer term, I don't like the action. But other than that, it looks pretty good. Okay, this looks kind of interesting. Let's see. 
again, a little bit on the thin side. Um, and longer term, it's got some issues. You've got a big gap down here. But, dude, that's like five years ago. Well, it's three years ago, but I hear you. Um, it's just kind of all over the place longer term, and it's also pretty, pretty thin. Not that I won't trade a thin stock. A lot of the IPOs I trade are thin. But I would I would exercise a lot of caution on this one. But I hear you. It's thrusted higher. It's pulled back again. Donald, another good another good pick. Looking at it shorter term, longer term is kind of all over the place, especially longer longer term. So I think I would pass based on that. But I hear you. RMBL. Yeah, this looks like, I don't know if this trading back here is legit. This looks like more of a new issue. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, this is not bad. Uh, again, a little bit on the thin side, but yeah, pretty good. Nice little knockout move. Yeah, it looks that looks good. I like that. But again, kind of thin. This trading back here I don't think is relevant. It looks like more of a new issue. So yeah, I like that one. That's probably the best so far. CDXS. 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 Okay, keep them coming. Um, I would put this on your momentum list. It's a little bit on the thin side, but not too bad. It needs a little bit more pullback. It can't have too much pullback, though, because it would come back into this range. Okay? So, yeah, this needs to be on your momentum list, but um, I think I would hold off for now. That other one you're asking, those that one that starts with a T, Don, Donald, that's on the lander list for today, so let's stay off of that out of courtesy to my clients. Um, this looks pretty good. With today's action in here, kind of a TKO type of move, it's already had a pretty good run, which makes it a little scary to get in, okay? But as a trend follower, sometimes you have to close your eyes. You have that nice persistent move higher. What did I just preach about? You've got a nice little knockout move. Let's take a look at a two-day chart. Yeah, two-day chart, you've got kind of a textbook TKO. So if we look at a two-day chart, and let's zoom in a little bit. You could almost go after this one on a in a textbook manner. Entry above here, stop below the low. But Dave, I, I can't use a 10-point stop. Well, then you don't get no Coke. You know, you can't trade this stock then. You have to find something else to trade. What did I say earlier? 8% eight, uh, 8 stop. The stock has moved 18% in two days. Okay? There it is, 18%, as you can see. It's moved 12% today. OK, so this stock is obviously more volatile. Now, I'm going to teach you a little something here, a little teach of a moment. 55 is a fairly high HV, but it's not that high. You look at the stock, it's like, well, this is kind of crazy. It just moved 18%. It's down 12% already today. How can the HV only be 55? Well, one of the anomalies of HV is that when you have a persistent trend, the volatility comes off. OK. Even though that persist, persistent trend is pushing that stock higher and it's made a pretty substantial move, like 30, 40, 50 percent over a short period of time, because it did it in such a persistent fashion, the volatility comes off. OK, so that HV doesn't fully re reflect the volatility of this stock. All right. Any more? Well, while we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my apologies for not getting the, the notices out of time and everything. Life's been kind of crazy around here, both in the markets and life itself. <laughs> and, uh, and also in my getting this big project out. So life's just been kind of crazy. And I haven't really been focused on the, the marketing the, to get the, peep, the uh, weekend charts out. So my apologies. And I appreciate you guys who are actually here today uh, who have somehow made it in spite of me really not. Uh, promoting it much or getting the new links up and all. So thank you for that. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead. Donald, that one's on the Landry list today. It actually is a setup. I just placed an order, order to buy it. So yeah, absolutely. Go after that one. Bring it up next week, week and uh, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Good luck with the new house. Let the wife get whatever she wants. Double ovens, etc. Oh, joy. <laughs> yeah, that could be kind of dangerous, huh? All right. Well, once again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm, I'm humbled by your presence. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thank you so much. You're welcome.